Well, I am indeed um, uh, sorry to stand between you and lunch, but see if we can get this over quickly. Um, uh, it's a, I think actually it's a lovely combination. I feel sort of a sense of um, uh, the a a peer group who don't get a chance to sit together otherwise, being able to come and share a few alternative uh, perspectives on what's going uh, what's going on in Afghanistan. And I sort of really think, I mean, well, I hope we can have a good conversation over lunch, because there's a lot of uh, what both um, uh, Lutz and Thomas said um, threw up lots of lots of questions I think that we should, we should jump into. Um, uh, and I'm glad that the theme is uh, how uh, Applying, applying a sensitivity to and an understanding of culture is first of all important for understanding how that society works. And if, if you venture to, uh, to either to be intervene or to perhaps constrain the interveners or advise the interveners, um, for, uh, those, those who, have, uh, who are intrepid enough to try and manage change in, uh, in that society, uh, then likewise, the knowledge of that culture is vital. They, th uh, I could fill the day with examples of where, of when I've experienced that. Uh, when, uh, when Lutz started off talking of language, um, I, want, I immediately wanted to jump into one of the moments in which I f felt I dis sort of despaired most um, and, uh, and really thought we do not learn is when a few weeks ago I had a chance to uh, spend a very brief bit of time in Afghanistan, meet, meet some wonderful people uh, like Thomas, ensure that as many as possible of them were, uh, were Afghans who had so much to say about what was going on in their country, but of course uh, meet with some uh, some, you know, colleagues in the international community there. I, uh, I was asked by you know, look, the people who are running the, you know, the Western military intervention if I could come along and join in one of the meetings they were doing at the Ministry of Defense. So this is, you know, this is the meeting insofar as the, you know, the, um, the Americans and their partners are uh, are involved in the war in Afghanistan. This is where they talk with the people. They say, "Are you know the Americans are not actually really fighting the war themselves? Are helping the Afghans secure their country?" And uh, yeah, I was yeah, brought there because there was some uh, some of the stuff that I that I work on on peace and understanding the Taliban was going to be uh, was going to be discussed. But first of all, they were discussing the harvest, the war, how the fighting is going on, the priorities, and. I have enough schooling from uh, to understand you. Know, you try not to intervene when you're not really needed, and when it's not you, when it's not your role. And I realised that the, the the translation was complete garbage. It was garbled. And I was just sitting, and the, the, I thought, you know, do I just keep quiet and mention something later? And I thought, okay, I can find a way of, you know, let's, let's, let's say this is a little bit complex, perhaps we can make this a bit of a discussion and sort of join in ra and try and maintain a rapport with the, the translator so that we can let, let's work this together. Um, I had uh, deliberately uh, brought along with me to, uh, to the meeting a, um, uh, a young Afghan student. Um, who was you know, who was helping me out while I was there in Kabul again on the same principle don't don't do anything by yourself in uh, in Afghanistan um, but he was a, um, a very uh, very gifted gifted young man and I wanted him to get a chance to sit in on some of the meetings and just learn what was going on and I asked him what did you think of that and he and he said he expressed the same sentiment I had I was appalled they couldn't understand each other that they so you take and in, in this case it was a there was something to do with cultural gulf rather than just linguistic challenge, because the translator was somebody who was linguistically was fluent um, in uh, both the languages which were being used, but struggled so much with the subjects that were being discussed that he could not he could not communicate them, and this meant that the people at the top of the war on the Afghan side and the top of the war on the American side could not understand what the other was saying. I was alarmed. The, um, f uh, and this is going to the point was that I think Thomas and I both got examples from the, of this from 2001 and 2002. 
uh, I despair that this example is from 2019. Um, and the the other, uh, the other sort of perspective I wanted to give on uh, and how I how I approach the issue of culture in trying to uh, to understand and work in Afghanistan is that you know, it's important and rich and without without the filter of culture you cannot meaningfully understand what's going on in, in, in society. But as as Lutz also refers to, culture is perpetually. In in a state of evolution, so we shouldn't expect we shouldn't expect a static culture. There's still, there's much you can learn, and there is continuity, but things but things change, and that is in the nature of, of culture. So if you want to understand culture, you've got to understand so the the yeah, how how culture is now. But culture is all culture, and, and it, yeah, there are cases in just about any context. But I think these I think this is particularly the case inside Afghanistan. It is disputed and it is manipulated. Disputed in the sense that they, there are arguments over what is, you know, arguments amongst Afghans over what is culture and what is bad culture and who can be accepted, which identities, how they fit into the, how they fit into society. It is perpetually, it is not just changing, but it is disputed at any one time. And they, uh, and is also manipulated in the sense it's not something where just that there's a sense a, an objective process of understanding what this is, presenting it, presenting it faithfully, uh, that there's a sense of people trying to establish a monopoly over, particularly in their interaction with foreigners, so that you can claim sort of, uh, claim authority for certain decisions or for certain interpretations on the basis of your superior, superior understanding of the culture, and the. Um, uh, I mean, one of the one of the sort of quizzical examples you have. I'm not sure if, you know, if Thomas is familiar with this one. Um, uh, was going back to you know, going going back to um, uh, October 2001, just after 9/11, but while Taliban were still in power. There's a uh, a yeah, um, a woman friend of ours is in Islamabad. And a an Afghan Pashtun man needs a lift to f uh, round to the Holiday Inn for I think where for whether some of the some of the uh, the interviews are going on with the media, um, and um, uh, when getting out, there's one of these things. With now in, in Europe, we'd understand as a me too a me too moment. He wants to have basically show some uh, un unwelcome familiarity and basically grab a kiss. And that she appropriately, she appropriately <coughs> rebuts him, knowing that they, she has because she has a sense of uh, um, uh, of you know, akhlaq and protocol that this is not this is this is not appropriate and doesn't and she doesn't want it. So manages to fend him off, and his answer is, oh, um, uh, it's in my Pashtun culture. I must have this kiss. Um, but anyway, it's duly fended off. Um, uh, all I can say is that he goes to exercise very high office. In the uh, uh, in this uh, uh, in the new dispensation, which is set up uh, only a month and a half later, uh, we can yeah, guess who guess who it might be later on. Um, but certainly in uh, in meetings that um, that I've had in the the presidential uh, palace, it became quite clear that some of the um, some of the, so the, the interlocutors that members of the international committee had, so there's the Afghans who had come to power as a result of the, the bomb process, uh, and this one in particular would be Pres President Karzai, mastered the art of, the, of justifying actions he wanted to take on the basis of his monopoly of you know, understanding Afghan culture. Particularly, he made a, a, um, a show of understanding all the tribes of Afghanistan, understanding the position of the leading families in Afghanistan, understanding how people should fit into the, yeah, um, uh, into the power structures, uh, and was able to, sense, to close off discussion, because of course this was like, it was like magic. This was, the, this was a magic wand um, that only he or someone qualified like, like him uh, could, uh, could wield. Um, and uh, most other Afghans and certainly all other for all other f all foreigners were excluded from this magic, and I think that the uh, whereas I think uh, I suspect that all th um, uh, all of the sort of the you know the so that the you know the, the, the 
so the, the graying haired men that you have had addressing you today. Um, we've, you know, we've all um, uh, invested in learning the languages, developing a sensitivity to the, to the culture, um, building up networks of people who we know and who we trust and they, and they trust us and through them we have many, uh, many introductions and we've all, you know, we're either, you know, we've tied our turbans, we've put on our pakul hats, we've worn our piran to bond and that's, uh, and we've probably along the way, uh, we've certainly built up much trust and share and enjoyed love, but also um, aroused many suspicions and at times have been considered subversive uh, because in a sense in you know, where I absolutely agree that in, in genuinely that they a, uh, uh, you know, a, a foreigner would be foolish to, tr to believe that they were really fooling people in terms of actually assuming an identity by that. Um, uh, but I think that rather than, rather than that uh, Afghans would be dealing with assuming that we're trying to really trying to fake an identity is that we're threatening the monopoly of those people who wave the wand. Um, it's there's something there. There is something threatening to least some some people in Afghanistan over that. So we, um, uh, you know, be beware of getting the balance between where one win, where um, uh, one gains, you know, respect and acceptance, uh, and also arouses suspicion. Now I've got a few notes. Um, although I almost almost tempted to do without. But anyway. Um, I want to spend a, uh, a few minutes focusing in on sort of my topic around uh, Taliban and culture and peace. How, for, um, how at least some understanding of culture can help un you know, unpick what's going on uh, around the attempts at a peace process in Afghanistan and particularly the role of the Taliban in this. And the, the can I just say, I mean, just, I mean, okay, our Afghan friends, okay, they have to, they're immersed in this. But they, for people who aren't Afghans, anybody been following sort of news of peace in Afghanistan the past few months? Anybody been following? Has anybody, anybody sort of, you know, who has, who has read at least one news story over the past eight months about peace in Afghanistan? Yeah, good, yeah. Good, yeah, 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 about sort of right back, half an hour quality. Um, they, if you were, if we were in, say, for example, if we were in, God forbid, in UK, and asked, you know, has anybody read a story about Brexit over the past while? And yeah, obviously, we first of all, all groan and say, how could we not? Well, sort of, yeah, peace in Afghanistan is a, it's a little bit like Brexit, except that, the, <laughs> that they, um, uh, except that perhaps people's reactions to it are slightly are slightly different. But yeah, it's an obs obsession and recurrent, and particularly since the the start of last year. They, there have been multiple stories about when you know that about something is happening on peace, uh, and and again to contrast um, contrast the sort of the the, the well justified sort of air of despair that Thomas left us with in terms of you know, talking about um, uh, the prospects for good elections in in Afghanistan uh, since the the start of last year uh, periodically there have been. Um, uh, you know, bouts of extreme hope that actually something is going to happen because even if you know, the, I mean, in, yeah, I think broadly most Afghans uh, want to see democracy work in their country, but we can be even more confident that the vast majority of Afghans want to see an end to this futile war and want to see peace uh, break out. So that they, I mean, when there's you know, when there is hope around, it becomes contagious. So for me, this is one of the, the, the interesting things about culture at the moment is can, can some glimpses of culture help us make sense of the talk, of the talk of peace? So give an example of what, pe what, of what people have had to, to make sense of over the, uh, the, the past uh, 18 months or so is that it sort of started, it started with um, something which has got I me mean, sort of dreadful um, uh, uh, you know, it's a dreadful like diplomatic term like Kabul Kabul three conference. So you can see it's classic. It's a you know, a conference or something something which has got a label as boring as Kabul three um, uh, is the kind of sort of like engineered. I know I, okay. I know with the, we're sitting in a college of diplomacy, but the rest of the world sort of takes with a pinch of salt uh, diplomatic set pieces. So there's a, like a diplomatic set piece. The president um, gets up and makes 
a, a prepared speech um, which contains a sort of offer saying that the, um, the Taliban movement, which is the armed opposition fighting against his government, is most welcome to come and participate in the political system. Uh, they will be accepted as a, legit as a legitimate uh, entity and we'll do everything we can to facilitate their full participation in the political system in the same way as other Afghans are participating. Now, the, 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 this was a, you know, a, a presidential speech. The international allies of Afghanistan played this up. The media played it up. Uh, and for quite a while, I mean, any, anywhere that I was participating in a conversation, in a, any conference or meeting with diplomats, would hear from them, this is a really big deal. Uh, there was a bout of hope. But uh, the question is, did it, you know, was there any basis for that? Nothing happened. The war didn't stop. The, uh, uh, a year ago now, so therefore only a few months, a few months after that, uh, there was another flurry of hope of peace, um, which was when the uh, same President Ghani uh, um, announced, uh, announced a unilateral ceasefire over the Eid holidays. And which, and I was, yeah, I sort of said, well, so I, I personally felt so, so what? And then was surprised when the Taliban actually s reciprocated. So the main armed opposition, which has been driving the, uh, driving the conflict, um, that they, uh, and which has you know, managed to take over about half of the country, um, they actually said for three days, we will th um, uh, uh, we'll stop fighting. And so this immediately realized, okay, this is actually more significant. And personally, I consider ceasefires more important than diplomatic set pieces. So even I start to take the you know, hope seemed to have a basis. And then suddenly things seemed to get out of control. We had sort of, because it was one of these classic, these classic things, you give one order expecting one thing, but people do something else. So the Taliban leadership said, stop fighting over Eid. And promptly, their, uh, their fighters basically left their positions, got onto their motorbikes, got into their pickups, went into town, and had a party. And the, you know, and the, the whole country was flooded with images of people fraternizing. And that they, yeah, uh, and I had, you know, I was out, out of Afghanistan that, uh, at that time, uh, but was getting calls from, uh, you know, from friends who were sort of like old warlords or you know, f um, serving officers in the government and said, I have 150 Taliban fighters to lunch. Um, uh, the, the, the interior minister on the street um, f uh, taking selfies with, uh, with Taliban fighters. Uh, this was very different from a diplomatic set piece that the, the Taliban leadership were deeply disturbed that this was going to subvert their, um, their war effort. But again, we all had to, to process what does this mean in terms of that they, it certainly seemed to be uh, quite a uh, strong glimmer of, glimmer of hope for peace at that stage, but we had to make sense of that. And then following from that, from we had in, in September, we had um, for, uh, a, um, we had an appointment in the US of Zulmay Khalil Zad as a special envoy for peace, uh, who basically started a, um, uh, an, intensive, uh, um, a, an intensive process of, I mean, that they, I mean, these people really collect air miles. If you become, if you become a sort of a peace envoy for Afghanistan, you get lots of air miles because it's not like, so yeah, again, Professor Lutz would be, yeah, would be sort of, you know, put on his Piran Tamboon and wander around the country talking to Afghans to see what about peace, or is actually an envoy, uh, an envoy instead start flying to sort of like 20 different world capitals <laughs> to say, what about peace in Afghanistan? And then gets into talk with, talks with Taliban uh, in different formats. The most sort of popular format which has happened so far is what they call you know, the, Doha, the Doha round. So we've had six, um, six um, sets of talks in Doha and the seventh is on its way. So <laughs> if it's such a good thing, let's have another. Um, and the, 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 the messages which have been projected are that the um, uh, uh, you know, peace is nigh or then that gets rewritten over, over time as um, we're making good progress, but need to, but need more dialogue. Um, so that the uh, people who follow the media, Afghan civilians sitting in the you know, in the government-controlled cities, but also even Taliban fighters who are having to make sense of WhatsApp messages which are sent around to them, and also their version of the media, and they can watch the um, uh, the, the the regular media. All are trying to interpret these uh, uh, these stories that you know, 
after, after six rounds of discussions in Doha and one more planned, um, inshallah, we're about, to, uh, we're about to have peace. Um, now, I, uh, I should say, uh, broadly, I am optimistic about the prospects of the, it, 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 it is possible for the war to end in Afghanistan relatively quickly. I, uh, uh, I share Thomas's sort of desire to avoid selling, selling false hope in the sense of saying it's not guaranteed. There's a list of things which have got to be done. They're not all, they're, yeah, they're not all happening yet. So it's, it is perhaps more likely that the war will continue, but it's something, but that is not a cause for despair. That is a cause for everybody who has an opportunity to actually to try harder. The, yeah, um, so, and spe specifically, I'm deeply skeptical of the, uh, the current peace processes. And I think that the, when we look harder, we can, see, we, can see some, uh, we can see some reasons, and there are some cultural clues if we, go, if we dig, do a deep dive. Um, I mean, of the very, you know, of the, 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 very, the very basics, shifting timetables, when people make sort of give predictions and promises and then don't deliver and then have to reformulate, that's always a, um, uh, you know, a clue that we have problems. Specifically, we had, um, uh, as an, or as an example of the, of the, kind, of, the kind of way that uh, research, research can give us clues, uh, I knew that the, the, the US negotiating team was telling their military to be ready for a ceasefire and do all the thing. Now, get everybody busy going around, you know, okay, book a, you know, book a trip to, to Nepal and work out how they did their ceasefire there. Fly a few people over to Oslo. It's, Oslo is a great place for discussing how ceasefires get, get a lot of buzz of, you know, of in, the, on, in uh, Western and to some extent, you know, trying to encourage the Afghan military also to, uh, to think through ceasefires. Um, and then it's all, and it's, there's a fighting season, which is basically as the once the once the opium harvest is finished in the um, uh, in the the main opium producing areas, then people are free to intensify their fighting. So, so there's, there's there's a seasonality defined in the way that the, uh, the war goes. It never actually stops, but so the peak fighting has got to be after the opium harvest is in. So the idea is there that the if you're going to get some kind of if you're going to make some kind of progress towards a ceasefire, you want to get it achieved before you get into sort of mid mid April. So over the you know that they and Khalid Zad started his mission at a very useful time. Uh, actually started work in October, got a chance to work through the the winter, had people looking forward to the ceasefire in the spring, and then the, the then the, it, it starts to change. We're getting um, news that the uh, um, uh, news that the it may not be a ceasefire, but at least they won't declare a, uh, a spring offensive, which is what the Taliban come, normally come out with as a, um, uh, a media a media a media release with the name of an offensive, and uh, and then they sort of they use it as a as a way of describing all the attacks that they conduct around the country through the year, they say it's part of this offensive. Uh, I was able to feed back as of a research, a research result um, uh, in March saying that, uh, well, actually, two of our researchers have been sort of drafted into what amounted to Taliban uh, focus group discussions to pick the most appropriate name for the offensive. Um, and our um, our uh, our uh, and our researchers reckoned that of the of the five names that they were asked to choose between, the one that sounded most most punchy was Al Fatah, <laughs> victory, the victory. Um, and so a month before a month before it was announced, on the basis of focus group discussions, we have to say the bad news is, alas, there will be a spring offensive, and there will be a name, and the name will be victory. Um, so sometimes, sometimes evidence is the best way to um, uh, to look at um, to give a clue as to what's happening. Now, just to just to be clear, how many? What time do you want me to stop? Um, you're you're uh, quite good on time. Yeah, but I'm going to leave some time for questions as well. So when do you want me to okay. stop? Just so, gonna... so you have 17 minutes left. 17 minutes. Okay. Okay. You want to leave for questions, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll divide. So I, okay. If I'm basically you want me to finish at half past. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. We'll finish at half. But I want to. So, the. A. Uh, for me, the best way to make sense of the the prospects for peace in Afghanistan and the claims that the the currents of the, these initiatives which have been going underway, uh, is to understand the culture of the the Taliban. 
And there's a uh, fair amount of work has been done on this. It's, it is possible to understand many of these things. Uh, I mean, it's a, the, the, ta the Taliban are both a, uh, a cultural phenomenon in the sense of that the, the members of the Taliban movement, uh, they have a particular culture, and which could, it fits into Afghan, into, into Afghan culture. It is a part of Afghan culture, but it has many distinctive aspects which have developed amongst the people who are religious students, people who have studied in the madrasas. That they, uh, so the, the men, and it is all men, who are members of the movement, that they, um, they, uh, they share in a set of norms which together constitute their culture. But since 1994, the Taliban movement has existed as a political movement, a specific phenomenon, which along the way that, they, that the members of that, they developed uh, a vehicle which they called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. That was the, the vehicle which they essentially uh, imposed on the state. That the manifestation of the state while the Taliban were, uh, were in power was called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. And that they, even after they were deposed from power and then started to, they launched an insurgency against the institutions which had been established during the, um, the Bonn Conference, which, uh, which Thomas referred to, they they refer to the Islamic State of Afghanistan, not as, not as something which was to be, um, in a sense, re-established once they, the, they won the war, which is what they were trying to do, but something which they were building progressively over time and which would assume full sort of state power once they won the war, but was meant to be a living and functioning entity along the way, as, you know, a real authority. So that there's on the one hand there is the um, there is the, the the body of the, the men in the Taliban who have a certain culture that they and who are part of a certain cultural community, and then then there is also this uh, this institution which they were trying to develop, which is also governed by some rules of political culture, and that they that if we were to study if you study that we can go through the, so they, their thoughts around leadership they have a concept of Amir al muminin a supreme or su supreme leader of their movement that they who then would be the head of the Islamic Emirate hence Emirate for the uh, for Amir uh, who is meant to be a supreme unquestionable authority certainly not subject to uh, to election uh, somebody who has a semi divine right that they are divinely guided that they and the, the the political idea of the Taliban was in a sense to impose their Amir as the um, f uh, supreme political authority. That the uh, part of the um, uh, the culture inside the movement was a set of rules around the the duty of obedience to this Amir, for which they draw on the, uh, um, uh, they draw on multiple religious references to construct this idea of the duty of obedience to the Amir to give them a movement where a movement which is that they uh, which is centralized by virtue of everybody's duty to obey the uh, the leader. Uh, but we can also act decentralized because people who are in the movement share in a common culture and know what to do even when they haven't been given orders. That they, um, uh, uh, when we start to look about this idea of the Taliban as, you know, as the, the members of the Taliban as being part of a cultural community and they fit, in, they fit inside um, a broader Afghan culture, remember the point that I made about culture being disputed inside Afghanistan and the place of different people inside the country that they uh, that, that is disputed the uh, uh, if we're to go back to uh, pre-war Afghanistan pre the 70s most of the most of the young men who became religious students who were known as Taliban then even before there was a, uh, a formal political movement they were from the poorest of the poor uh, they were young men who had essentially been given up to a religious life, largely as a way of, um, of feeding them. And they had a sense of, in a sense, social and political exclusion and inferiority, which they compensated by developing as of an identity whereby they said but, that they, uh, but the, their self-identity was as we are the sole possessors of true religious knowledge and therefore are superior to the rest of society because we have a, a monopoly over this, uh, over this knowledge. 
and there has been a constant tension between uh, the, the Taliban and since the, the rest of society, which becomes a subset between the, the tension between urban society and rural society, which we can see has been you know, a, a common theme in Afghanistan prior to the wars of the current of the of the last 40 years and certainly continuing through these 40 years so that they the Taliban become one part of rural society rebelling against urban society and rebelling against the, the domination of uh, you know, of urban elites that the there's a a long list of uh, of cultural analyses that we can do of the Taliban to understand how they tick and what drives the war. And what, what I would say is that if we, um, uh, if we do that analysis properly, we can see that most of the claims of the ability of the current processes to, to deliver a, a peace agreement between the Taliban and on the one hand the Americans, and on the other hand the, uh, the Afghan government or the elites who are gathered inside the Afghan government, these, these, uh, um, these claims seem very shallow, that they the imp implausible, that they, I have seen the, because the whole political idea which has been pushed around the Taliban by the Taliban involves them demanding a monopoly of power and yet the idea behind the, the, the working towards the settlement is that the, that the Taliban will be prepared to uh, take their place in a power-sharing, broad-based government, that they will be able to uh, sign off on a deal which includes one of the, the principles that Thomas referred to earlier on, which, uh, which is that, that of pluralism. I, in my studies of the Taliban, I've seen no evidence of that shift. But meanwhile, I've seen a movement which still is relatively centralized, still re relatively able to enforce the idea of obedience to their uh, emir, still with a strong sense of otherness and a sense, a sense of being a vanguard with a mission to, uh, to take over the country. So I would say that my, by uh, looking, at, you know, looking at the culture of Taliban, specifically their political culture, I've concluded that the claims that sort of pieces are about to break, break out through a top-down process of negotiation um, f uh, seem highly implausible. But the hope that I would see is that we could, if we could actually come into you know, make that distinction between members of the Taliban as you know, Afghans who are a part of a particular cultural subset inside Af you know, Afghan society and the specific vehicle of their Islamic emirate, then perhaps there is no political deal is possible with their Islamic emirate, but that it is possible over time to look at a reworking of the sort of a reconciliation between the Taliban who are currently organized to fight in the Islamic emirate, a, rewor a reworking, a reintegration, a reconciliation between those people and their, uh, and their fellow Afghans. Now, I want to just, as I, as I wind up, I want to actually just to show a few um, uh, show just a few of these pictures to get um, to be just to concretize it. We leave a, leave a you know, couple of minutes for the uh, for the, the question. Just because I, mean, I made the point that they uh, for me the Taliban the Taliban are largely a cultural phenomenon, and they have they uh, they use cultural signals. And just that they just I mean just while I was sitting here, I picked up a couple of pictures of how Taliban represent themselves. This is as fresh as yesterday. Um, somebody who's called uh, somebody who's called uh, Kari Salahuddin, uh, and that they, uh, if, I were, if I were interpreting this, so the, the, the signals around it, first of all, that, um, as mentioned earlier about so the you know the, the fancy headgear that in different parts of the country um, f uh, people were. If I'm interpreting this, it's he's wearing a white turban, which is part of. Uh, um, uh, asserting, asserting his, uh, uh, asserting his membership of the Taliban, so they because the Taliban adopted adopted white turbans, which were some of them were you know, they would be would be familiar in Pashtun parts of the country, but he is an Uzbek, but is uh, is quite comfortable wearing a wearing his white turban, flagging up his his Taliban identity. Um, they. Uh, the trimmed beard is interesting, which in the, during, during the period of power of the Taliban, um, they, 
uh, a, yeah, a, trim, a trimmed beard would have been enough to get you whipped. So that he's, some, that the, he's signaling something there about that they, yeah, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, new age, new age Taliban, that they, yeah, uh, that they, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a ch this, will be a ch this will be a challenge to, f uh, to most Taliban as to why is somebody who is such an important person, um, uh, why is actually presenting himself with, the, uh, with his beard. Sometimes, sometimes people justify having trimmed beards because they had, to be, they, had to tr they had to move to and fro between areas controlled by the government where you should have a trimmed beard or no beard to areas controlled by the Taliban where you should have a, you should have a long beard and therefore this is the, the lowest common denominator would be the trimmed. And of course, clasping... You know, uh, clasping a gun is another is a uh, is a very almost like a subtle projection of part of the, the part of the essence of the Taliban is is as if I if I were to describe their essence it would be as um, armed armed uh, Sunni mullahs. So yeah yeah the the subtle is because it's actually the, the picture done in a nice way the, the the gun isn't such as doesn't look quite as big as often they are in these pictures. Um, this. Uh, this is another recent recent picture, and this is just a basically, basically sent as a you know, as a selfie from uh, a Talib who I know. And I, I when I when I looked at this, the first thing I thought of was actually as a miniature painting. I mean, it's almost it's a. Yeah, um, uh, I felt that the uh, the way that he set himself up for the picture, um, for, uh, it was to project a certain kind of beauty. That the, I mean, he's yeah, he's deliberately he's conscious he's conscious of looking beautiful. And okay, okay, the white, you know, the white turban and all the rest of that. But that they, I mean, he's that they. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I will actually specifically ask him. Did you know that you would be looking like a miniature painting in this? Um, but they, but now that, where those are, you know, these are fairly sort of, you know, like you say, like very cultivated Taliban. Well, if you want the rougher, if you want the rougher image here. Now, I mean, this is, um, uh, uh, and these again are these are images which were. Um, I think s selected by either the the commander himself or his friends to project a desired image. So this is you know this is a controlled image. Now the sitting sitting reading a religious book is a great way of projecting that I am a man of religion. Whereas uh, when many of us who study the way the war is fought, I mean sometimes you know religion is crassly instrumentalized and it's very difficult to think that somebody you know, follows religious principles in everything they do but when trying to project yourself and legitimize yourself you must show your association uh, association with the religion now that they and this person actually he, I mean, he runs what's called a, uh, a red force one of those are the, the Taliban strike force these are the, like the main fighting arm of the Taliban at the moment Hence, you know, it's a much bigger gun than the. Um, uh, uh, you, it, it, it sort of like dominates the picture um, uh, it, much more than the one of Kari Salahuddin. So, yeah, Haji Naguib, Haji Naguib is getting the message across. Yeah, you know, we've got big guns. We fight hard. He's projecting. He's projecting power. Um, uh, I mean, it's interesting. Even in the, the f um, f uh, I mean, Luther's point about you know, switching your 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 headgear as you move around the country. Uh, He's actually from he's actually from the west in Kandahar, where normally he would be wearing a turban. But he's operating against Islamic State in eastern Afghanistan, so he switched over to wearing a you know a, 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 a pakol, um, the, the the form of cap which is common in that uh, in that area. Uh, and I mean perhaps you know Lutz can tell us about so the, the the cultural history of long of long hair, that they in polite society both rural and urban, men would have short hair. But, but that there are I mean, there are few there are few tribes on the in the border areas where there's a longer history of long hair. But during the conflict, long hair has been adopted by many of the armed factions, and I believe they claim references in Islamic history and some of the some of the, so the fighters of the companions of the Prophet who wore who wore long hair. But in in a sense, it's become a subculture in terms of uh, amongst Afghan Afghan fighters. So that he's that they and uh, I will just show the the of the an example of where you get sort of cultural again yeah, more sorry sorry more um, yeah, more images images of what Taliban look like yes yeah, this is this, this is an, this is a fighting group of Taliban so anybody who's trying to talk about peace agreements so, so yeah any peace process is something that these people accept whereas 
they, uh, on the right is one of the, the recent rounds of peace negotiations. And the culture of sim images you'll see there is that this is clearly a formal setting. And do you remember what Lou said earlier on about that, the, that King Amanullah ordered that anybody visiting a government office or working in it should wear dressy, should wear th this stuff. And so that would apply to any formal occasions. Whereas these people are clearly, they're Taliban, they're in a formal occasion, and they know they're acting formal, they're acting as diplomats, but they have very explicitly retained their pirin tambon, the nice neat waistcoats, and, and their headgear, which is a, yeah, a fascinating little cultural statement themselves. But they, um, uh, right, one of the, the, last, the last cultural symbol that I wanted to show before, you know, a few minutes for, uh, for questions, was the, uh, this was just a, a case study of some local peacemaking that um, some colleagues of mine were involved in, it, basically getting, getting Taliban, and, um, Taliban and government sides together. And this was like, so basically it was a, there was a wedding and a wrestling match, and, a, and they had basically dis, uh, managed to get government people to come to Taliban territory, participate in the event, and discuss how to avoid killing each other and the people in the area, something which some of us like to encourage. But they, I loved this, this photo taken from behind, because when you look at it, you, see, right, you can see the, see the hair, long hair? This is, yeah, and guess what? His name is Osama, and he is the, he is the local top Taliban commander. And if you look over here, this is he's clean shaven, and he's wearing. So they, there's a they, even the prayer cap is like is like it's neutral. It's neutral headgear. Is the prayer cap? This is the local government commander, sitting together, doing practical local peacemaking. But while with their in a sense projecting projecting a sense of cultural a cultural statement of who they are. So anyway. Um, there is, you know, there is hope. If there's going to be any progress, but it will have to be culturally informed. Uh, and certainly, uh, remember the distinction between sometimes working out the culture of the people that you're dealing with, as opposed to the political <coughs> culture of the of the sort of vehicle that they're working in. I know we went to go for lunch, but a couple of questions. Couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah if, if you want, yeah. actually, yeah, I, let's have some questions. I think we can all agree that <coughs> this topic is of great weight and importance. Right. For lunch is 30. I don't think it will be a great offense to anyone if we shorten it to 20. And if you both like to sit up and we can actually yeah, sure, have sure. Yeah, sure, yeah, come on. And whom are you, will you please stand and introduce and tell us who you're, who you're addressing the question. Okay, I'm trying, since I'm from Afghanistan and the topic is all about Afghanistan, so it concerns me to ask you questions. So before asking questions, it's not only question, but also my comments and a question and a recommendation. Um, all of our honorable speakers mentioned the word Afghanistan. So we are at the center of cultural diplomacy. Uh, it's a center of understanding cultures and ethnic groups. So I would like to mention that the word Afghan refers to a specific ethnic group. It would be much better, in my opinion, if we use the word citizens of Afghanistan rather than Afghanistan. Why I am mentioning is that we are at the center of cultural diplomacy. So we should we should assimilate and we should not, like it is not integrate integration but taking over someone's identity if you're calling someone somebody what they are not. And because Afghanistan is not a very old country. It's just it, it is only like three hundred years old before that. Okay, so I'm not going much into details. And about the Taliban and peace, peace talks, the whole idea of negotiations, I asked yesterday again, uh, yesterday as well, I didn't get very clear answers for that. I would like to ask you as well as a foreigner, what do you, I would like to know your opinion about this. The whole idea of negotiations and ceasefire, it's all against the Taliban's ideology, against the Taliban's uh, constitution. How would you actually? How how can like medias all over the world, Western medias can can concentrate about this piece, talking, making it? In my opinion, it's a bubble rather than making people delivering people to a confusion, to a bubble rather than peace talking. And as well, the people who represent Afghanistan are not accepted by the ruling party, by the ruling government. How would that actually work since when it comes to negotiations? And my last, uh, and the, mm, the Taliban have an official uh, 
office in Doha, how does the rest of the world, if they actually think about bringing peace in Afghanistan, how they are not uh, putting sanctions on Qatar, or would they provide an office for, uh, for Taliban State, which, which is like a big uh, school of terrorism, which Western media believes. And if U.S. actually thinks about bringing peace in Afghanistan, after 2001, with the, with the accusation of Osama bin Laden leaving in Afghanistan, they took over Afghanistan within 24 hours. Why is now taking U.S. 17 years cannot help this Taliban issue? Thank you very much. It was helpful. Yes, all right, long question. Mm, okay, we'll, well, we'll that, that was, yes, that was, um, uh, sort of an invitation to a uh, another discussion, Shreve. But well, first of all, Shreve, I, I mean, I think your your first comment, um, uh, I was, I'm delighted to hear it because if you think the the first point I made was that uh, culture is not just evolving; it is disputed. So that the um, there's uh, there's scope for I mean, there's scope for controversy around about any aspect of Afghan culture or identity, and the very fact that you can object to the. Um, the blanket term uh, Afghan applies to all citizens of the country is a very good example of that. So, um, yes, I mean, the uh, culture uh, culture in Afghanistan is disputed, and the, um, anybody anybody wishing to either first of all understand or play a role in public life in Afghanistan has got to uh, understand and, and demonstrate sensitivity. Um, uh, on the issue of the uh, on the issue of the, uh, the Taliban and peace talks, I mean, I, in a sense, what you've come back, you summarised you summarised what I was saying in the uh, in, in the, the talk. I have spent um, uh, long hours sitting with many members of the Taliban movement, um, uh, and uh, much of what I hear from them in terms of their personal aspirations, their aspirations for the country, how they how they see life, uh, um, much of it overlaps substantially with that which I hear from other Afghans as I you know, travel around the country or meet them, meet them elsewhere who are not part of or even are opposed to the Taliban movement. And for me, if there's some hope, when I say that they, actually, it is possible to see peace in Afghanistan and end to the conflict, certainly the current state of the conflict, it's because of that overlap. However, I think that they, I mean, I made the point that they, the, the, yeah, the, the, as, as a political vehicle, the Taliban movement seeks to um, impose what amounts to an authoritarian system in Afghanistan um, with, a single, with a single emir as a source of all authority and certainly no reference to, uh, uh, to the will of the people. Um, and yeah, I, I don't see a way of re resolving that um, through negotiations unless there is fundamental compromise over the past eight months has been no sign no sign of willingness for compromise certainly on the uh, on the Taliban side therefore if I were um, if I were to construct a peace process in Afghanistan I mean maybe you could keep this going you know keep this going for as long as as, yeah, as long as you like but you would sidestep it by trying to find find other addresses for the Taliban and in other forms of engagement between t Taliban and non-Taliban frankly a bit like this I would like to see this replicated a thousand times. And you know what? The war will just peter out. Because the only reason that the that the, you know, international representatives are taking the time to go and spend like 16 days negotiation with a, uh, um, a, a Taliban delegation in, um, uh, in Qatar is because the Taliban are fighting hard. They've captured over half the country. That they um, that for all our sort of hope for this is like the sense that you know the the, the, you know, the new Afghanistan and all this sort of flourishing in the cities and so on. Frankly, that those um, uh, for all sorts for all sorts of reasons um, that that new system that you know, flawed new system has not proven able to defend itself against the military threat posed by these people. So I don't think you're going to get a, an answer in the negotiations in uh, in Doha. Um, Ultimately, I suspect Afghans can find a way of working it out through, you know, through this kind of discussion, and this is what should be facilitated. And in the end, I mean, please go easy a little bit on Qatar. It was the Americans that asked them. They, I personally had a chance to meet with the um, uh, then heir apparent, now the Emir, um, when they were starting it, when they received the request from the Americans. I know that uh, I know that his intent was to, to gain some good credit for for Qatar internationally to help. Afghanistan and the uh, and the U.S. 
Um, I, you know, I don't agree with the way the strategy is rolled out, but I can, sp I can speak to you for the intentions of the Qataris in trying to help. And also, I mean, uh, imagine that the move to Qatar put the Taliban a little bit out of the influence of Pakistan, which is even more difficult. And I think in, in that sense, uh, uh, it actually made sense to, to move them to Qatar if you want to talk with them. And that's my big question here. I mean, the whole thing in the presentations and in the questions concentrate on the Taliban as if they were the only bad actor in Afghanistan. With what justification do you talk like this about the, Af uh, about the Taliban and do not mention all those warlords, human rights abusers, and war criminals who are part of the current Afghan political system. So, and the second question, which is even bigger, how do you want to make peace in Afghanistan without talking to the Taliban on the local level or on the central level? I see a little bit of a, of a problem in saying that the Taliban are relatively centralized and they adhere to the principle of the Amir al-Mu'minin, which is very difficult to challenge, and then getting people on the local level making peace because at some point the leadership will tell them you can't do that and we send someone over if you continue doing that and, and we take you out of that. Um, so I think in the moment where uh, uh, we all think about how the war in Afghanistan can be ended, Afghans and non-Afghans, um, we need to try different ways until we find out which the way is which leads to, leads to success, yes. All right, um, that filled our 10 minutes, but it seems unfair for only one person to ask questions, so let's ask some very brief and to the point questions. I saw a first name, first hand right there, then there, then there. Go. <laughs> Go. Hi, um, thank you very much for both of your presentations. My name is Natasha um, from Australia. Um, I was hoping to ask something that I was kind of thinking about looking at some of your last slides is the peace process, and I obviously realize that this is a very different circumstance, but thinking about something like the Northern Ireland peace process where something like back channel communication, a bit of mediation, was able to build confidence between parties, uh, it was able to overcome some of the media restrictions that might have played out negatively and ultimately, with its challenges, um, result in a peace settlement. I wonder whether or what you think the main impediment of that kind of approach would be in this situation. Um, Okay, so that's the first question. Uh, it was one, two, three, and then four, <coughs> and then five. All right, one, two. <laughs> And sorry, oh, I, I mixed that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an interesting topic, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one, two, and we had three, and then four, five, six, seven. All right. doesn't have an interest in that, that we, we should be called 
Okay, and yes, yes, sir. Thank you. And were there any other questions? Yes, sir. And we'll, we'll end there with questions. Let them answer. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Uh, wonderful uh, lecture. I am uh, Adnan Qureshi from Baghdad, from Iraq. I would uh, like to question what the difference between the Taliban ideology and culture about the organization of the Islamic State? Thank you so much for your questions. Gentlemen? Uh, I take the start. Okay, I start from the back because that's one of the few questions which probably only needs one sentence. The difference between the Taliban and the IS is that the IS has a, a global agenda and the Taliban have a national agenda. Um, there was no Afghan in the planes on 9-11. Uh, uh, there's rarely an Afghan who's involved in any terrorism outside uh, his own country. Um, the questions before are all a little bit more, more complicated. I mean, uh, I also heard that many times in Afghanistan about, oh, it's mainly Pakistan, not so much our problem, uh, uh, the Taliban and probably even uh, uh, not Afghans and whatever. I think that's a little bit wishful thinking. I mean, if you go to Afghanistan and work there, and we definitely have uh, 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 done that, uh, and we have met Taliban, and most of them know their prayers, and most of them are from Afghanistan. All that stuff about the foreign fighters, of course they are foreign fighters. Most of the foreign fighters are Pakistanis. Most of the Pakistani foreign fighters are Pashtuns, uh, who probably think about themselves not too much about Pakistanis or Afghans, but as, as Pashtuns and a part of the Taliban movement. But I think militarily, they don't make a, a big difference. It's very nice for propaganda if you can say the Taliban uh, are uh, uh, the puppets uh, of a neighboring government or of a neighboring state because then you can uh, uh, you don't need to discuss about the problems you have in your own country. I think it's a 50-50 thing, you know, the external factor and the internal factor. As Afghans concentrate on the internal factor, uh, don't, I mean, I, I don't mean you should not deal with the external factor too, but if you discuss it amongst yourself, you also need to really scrutinize what's happening, what has been happening in your own country and and your own society, and just to externalize the whole issue doesn't lead uh, uh, to, to a solution for the problem. Um, do the Taliban think about the post-US Afghanistan? Yeah, that, that's really the, the biggest question. I mean, we get more and more stuff in, in writing and speeches uh, uh, from them than we had many years before, uh, uh, but we do not have a full 
clear picture of uh, what their ideas about the future political system would look like. I mean, Michael has said he thinks that they actually would prefer to fight it out and win militarily, uh, but it will, uh, uh, even after withdrawal of the US, it will not be uh, uh, that easy. So maybe some room for compromise. What I usually say is don't expect the Taliban turn themselves into a political party because they don't believe in that uh, uh, democratic pluralist, uh, in that democratic uh, um, political system. They believe in, uh, when they speak about elections, and apparently they have uh, said something positive about elections uh, here and there, although it's, it's all a bit fishy what exactly they have said or unclear. Um, it's probably about the Shura principle, where some Islamic movements can nominate their own people and then have something like an election. So first you have a selection and then you have an election. That's probably their, their idea how they can deal in the transitional phase. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the Taliban, but not only the Taliban, would try in the future just to monopolize power again. I mean, none of these factions have been... Uh, uh, very good in, in, in sharing power. I mean, in the moment, it looks like as of a national unity government, you have some of the factions involved there. But I mean, they usually want to win elections, not through democratic means, but through manipulation. And they criticize uh, uh, the presidents because they control the apparatus, but at the same time, they would like to control the apparatus themselves so they can win in the end. So we uh, uh, should not uh, think in black and white about Afghanistan. So good, all these people who are with us in the moment, in quotation marks in the Taliban, uh, on the other side, I think it's uh, much more complicated. Um, uh, Natasha, uh, yeah, back channels back channels are great, but they're not sufficient. The the reason that back channel diplomacy uh, assisted in Northern Ireland was because the uh, uh, the members of the the main armed organisation. Uh, were involved in a vigorous debate uh, in uh, which basically took their took their movement to the conclusion that they you know, that achieving Irish unity would be better served by embracing what they called as the peaceful democratic struggle. Uh, it was that that dis, you know, it was through then that tendency inside the movement which meant that there was always like something to talk about in the back channel. Um, without without that um, decision which they made for themselves. Um, you know, back channel could have done you know, perhaps the odd CBM, but nothing else. Uh, in Afghanistan, there is yes, there is a history of people using back channels, but I think that the problem is not the lack of back channels. The cha the, the the problem is that for for many reasons, the the main armed group fighting against the government in Afghanistan has not made so has not had the change of heart that the um, that the IRA had in uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, I mean, there are I mean there are some other little. Um, uh, um, uh, sort of almost like Afghan, Afghan specific issues that there's a long, there's a long tradition of fake back channels in Afghanistan. <laughs> that they, um, uh, a little bit, I think you have back, um, yeah, doing it the Af doing it the Afghan way, um, uh, and this is this is another thing which has been brilliantly manipulated over the years by both sides, uh, people impersonating. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, either either side to communicate bomb messages and try and make money. Um, and on the, uh, I mean, on Ali's issue around the, um, uh, the issue of the, the Taliban, Taliban being independent, the the role of the, the role of regional interests. Uh, I, mean, I think it's it is uh, of course it's appropriate that um, uh, it's appropriate that anybody pursuing peace in Afghanistan should seek some kind of regional consensus in support of it. Uh, uh, my, um, but my my sense is that. Uh, that the the parties to the Afghan conflict actually think for themselves. Um, uh, they have their own you know, their own sense of agency, uh, and they tend to they tend to manipulate um, foreign powers getting involved in Afghanistan perhaps more effectively than <coughs> foreign powers pursue their own objectives inside Afghanistan. Um, so I think that as Thomas said, that the fo um, focus on getting things right inside Afghanistan is. Um, uh, or the the fact that there are some regional interest and international inter interest in Afghanistan should not be um, a deterrence to Afghans in trying to uh, pursue a settlement amongst themselves. Uh, and I think the fact that the Taliban have complex international links, which they boast about all the time now, um, uh, doesn't mean that they, it's it is ultimately it's Taliban uh, Taliban leaders and members of the Taliban movement, the fighters. Who've, um, who decide, and that they, um, 
uh, the, you know, the, the obedience to the emir only works as long as people are obedient or consider he is somebody who is worthy of having ob uh, obedience. That the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan you know, only matters as long as it actually has, has a place in the minds of millions of Afghans. Um, for, uh, so that the, um, the, the, you know, so the, the apparent complication should not be a deterrent. And personally, when I, when I have discussions, whether it be with Taliban or people who are engaging with Taliban, I actually try to simplify it. And say that is, you know, I, I suggest a starting proposition for any dialogue is that there is no further justification for killing of Afghans. <coughs> and that just simplifies it down to the basics. Uh, and then, of course, you're gonna, you, you, can, you, know, you can add in the other factors as well, but don't allow them to crowd a sort of a basic starting principle that they um, there is no justification for the the, the further killing of Afghans. Um, on the uh, and I mean on the sort of the spirit of um, uh, the spirit of rising above rising above sort of the ethnic or tribal identity. I mean it's yeah it's sort of interesting and admirable and it is also quite interesting that one of the founding principles of the Taliban is a rising above notions of tribe. And it's interesting that when we look at when we look at the Taliban, that's the proclaimed ideology, and at various times they sort of say it publicly. And um, uh, and yet, when we study how they operate, that the commanders inside the Taliban use their you know they you know, they use their links with their kinsmen. If you're going to recruit, I know if you're going to recruit a facilitator to launch a suicide bombing attack, you'll you're more likely to ask somebody from your tribe because you know you'll trust them and they'll trust you. So they claim to be above tribe while actually operating inside a, uh, a tribal context, um, and you know, uh, yeah, I, I agree that the, the still Taliban are prof profoundly an Afghan phenomenon. They have their own culture, but it's a, but there's a there's a this this wonderful overlap between so the you know the culture the culture of what's going on in the rest of the country and inside the Taliban movement. I've had as somebody who's researches this. I mean, I found times when I've used sort of like similar political cultural explanations for very specific things going on inside government territory and inside the, the Taliban movement. And this, fact, two finally, do the Taliban think about a post-US Afghan, post, uh, Afghanistan? We, you know, we know empirically that they do. I personally think that much of the, much of the, um, the thinking about it is, um, is ill-informed. It's poorly developed. For example, they are comfortable, they have the comfortable assumption that all those foreign educated Afghans or Afghans who have got international links or former diaspora who come back to serve, that they will disappear as the Taliban, they will go back to come back to Europe or the US as the Taliban take up power. I don't think it's real, but that, these are the kind of assumptions that they make. But yes, they are, think, they are thinking to a future Taliban run uh, Afghanistan after the Americans leave. And they have this, this key assumption, which I believe is wrong, that, they, that they, as soon as the Americans leave, Everything else will collapse, and everybody, the other people, either leave or surrender to us. And on the on on um, <coughs> uh, and on the issue between Islamic State and the Taliban, Thomas is absolutely right on the, the <coughs> that there's a fun, <coughs> there's a fundamental difference between Taliban as a as a movement which develops to try and reform Afghanistan, as the Islamic State that wants to establish a uh, a, <coughs> a uh, multinational um, caliphate. But in terms of the actual structure of the organisation. And some of this, yeah, and some of the ways that they that, um, the, uh, that they operate, that the uh, Islamic State looked to the Taliban and adopted many Taliban practices, and even before they I mean, one of the fascinating episodes was before Abu Bakr Baghdadi proclaimed himself as caliph, his emissaries wandered around Afghanistan and Pakistan looking for the Taliban emir to see if it was the right thing to do. Alas, you know, the, alas, the emir at that time was dead, but undeclared as such, so that, the, uh, so that Abu Bakr's uh, emissaries could not find him. And they only declared the caliphate after failing to find the, uh, the Taliban. Anything you'd like to add? Or? All right. So we have officially skipped lunch, but don't worry. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, Ms. Rosie has prepared all our food for us. You'd be so upset if we didn't eat it, and I'm sure we'd be so upset if we didn't get to enjoy it. So we'll take a 30 minutes for lunch and just understand that we'll run over time. Probably a bit optimistic of the ICD to think Afghanistan could be put in in 45 minutes. So let's just let's give everyone a round of applause. Thank you.